Hello, and welcome to Rev. Collins Reflections and Wingham United Church. Now, this service is being prepared for October 13th, 2022. God spoke to Adam, and Adam heard God's voice and set out confidently into the unknown. God challenged Moses, and Moses heard God's voice and brought freedom to a people. God empowered Amos, and Amos heard God's voice and exposed attitudes of selfishness and greed to the light of day. God anointed Jesus, and Jesus taught us to hear God's voice and to follow where God would lead us. God's call comes to our faith community. We respond to God's call with worship and compassion, working to shape our world according to God's design. We light the Christ candle once again as a visible reminder of Christ's presence among us. Let's pray. Faithful, loving God, in summer or winter, in good times or in bad, you are there. You seek relationship with us as a parent loves a child. You offer us guidance, but give us the freedom to make our own choices. When life does not go as we hope, you offer us support and comfort. When the choices we make are unwise, you offer forgiveness. When we cry out in despair, you hear us. And through it all, Lord, you offer us your compassion, mercy, and grace. We come to you, loving God, to deepen our relationship with you, to seek your wisdom for our lives. May we learn to follow the example of your own dear son, Jesus, that we may live lives of blessing and bring change to our world, that it may become the world you created it to be, the world that Jesus envisioned when he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our opening hymn for this service is number 427 from Voices United, to show by touch and word. Here we are back in Brother Bear's study once again. And as always, let's begin with a word of prayer. God of the earthquake and the silence, quiet in us any voice but your own, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we might hear, and in hearing we might believe, and in believing we might act, making way for your new creation. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by you, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Amen. 
Well, this week we're actually having two readings from the book of the prophet Isaiah, or maybe I should say prophets Isaiah. Uh, in our live worship service, Isaiah 12 will be read as a, a responsive reading. Um, that doesn't translate so well in, on a YouTube video, so I'm just going to read uh, that section for you. Uh, Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Well, now we move on to very much later in the book of Isaiah, uh, and to what we would refer to now as 3rd Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 to 25. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person that does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain says the Lord. We turn now to the second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 6 to 13. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work, now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. And finally, we turn to the Gospel of Luke once again, chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that it is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, 
nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Well, here ends our reading of this week's scripture lessons. May God bless them to our enlightenment and understanding. Amen. The, the life of the Israelites, Israelite people, as told in the Hebrew scriptures, is, is one of constant rise and fall. According to scripture, there's a, a consistent and predictable pattern. For a time, the people are faithful to God. They worship God and follow God's commands, and they live in peace with their neighbors. And, and life is good, peaceful, and prosperous. Over time, however, they begin to believe that their good fortune is due to their own effort and ability, and they begin to um, honor and obey God less, and follow their own agendas, desires, and reasoning. And this begins a slippery slope toward a society that is uncaring, unjust, and corrupt. Sooner or later, disaster strikes. Now throughout the Hebrew scriptures, this most often takes the form of an attack by a hostile empire. Uh, sometimes the Babylonians, sometimes others, um, followed by occupation, exile, even enslavement. Um, after a period of suffering and pain, the people once again turn to God and things begin to improve. Eventually, freedom, peace, and prosperity return, only for the cycle to begin all over again. Our Hebrew scripture readings today are indicative of this ebb and flow in the history of Israel. Now, in, in Isaiah 12, the prophet tells the people that a day will come when life will be good for the people. Now, this is good news because it follows several chapters of some pretty dark and troubling prophecies. Isaiah tells the people that due to their own actions, failure to obey God, death and destruction will be their fate. Some believe that these disastrous events are punishment from God for their unfaithfulness, but I think it's more likely that by turning away from God and failing to follow God's guidance, the people bring such disasters upon themselves, the, the very disasters God was trying to help them avoid. Whichever the case, Isaiah offers a light at the end of the tunnel. In due course, a messianic recreation of their world will happen. And in those days, they will sing praises and thanks to God. They will trust God and not be afraid of earthly turmoil. Peace and prosperity will be theirs once again. Now in our other reading from Isaiah, chapter 65, um, it, it comes from a much later period in Israel's history. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not the same Isaiah that delivered the prophecy uh, in chapter 12 that I just spoke about. Most contemporary theologians agree that this is the third prophet known as Isaiah. Uh, the message, however, is not that different. Uh, this time, God's people are actually living in exile, but hope is on the horizon. God is about to create a new heaven and a new earth. All the pain and suffering, injustice and persecution of the past will be so far from their minds they won't even be remembered anymore. In this new nirvana, people will live long, productive, happy lives. In the past, they built homes and planted crops only to have others steal it all away, but that will not happen in God's new creation. People will reap the benefits of their own work and pass their good fortune on to future generations. 
Peace will be known by all creation, people and animals alike. No more will there be a predator against prey, for they will all sit down and eat together. Now, I believe that, of course, to be a metaphor for relationships between people and between nations. Israel has too long, or too often, and for far too long, been preyed upon by other nations. Predators with stronger armies bent on domination and empire. The poor and helpless have been victimized by people in power. But that will all disappear in the new reality that God is creating. Heaven and earth will not be separate, different realities. There will be no distinction between the two. God will, once again, dwell among the people, and all people will be blessed. Everyone will live with justice, peace, security, and love. Now, this same message of a coming messianic age carries over into the New Testament, of course. In fact, Jesus came to bring it about. He warns the people, though, that there will be hard times to endure before this recreation comes to pass. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdoms will go to war. Natural disasters will occur. All of these are signs of something new and better coming. But God's people must be patient and faithful. They will endure persecution and isolation. They will be outcast by society, even their own families. They have tough decisions to make. They must choose God over the opinions and approval of other people. They will have to stand firm in their beliefs, even when it means imprisonment and torture. When they are brought before judges, kings, and governors, they must stand with integrity and testify to that which they believe in, regardless of the outcome. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus always seems to tell his followers in one way or another that following him won't ever be easy, but it will be worth it. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul is addressing a more down-to-earth problem, but I believe his message has implications for us on a much grander scale. It seems that there are people connected with the church in Thessalonica who are freeloading off of the rest of the congregation. Remember that the Christian way is for everyone to share whatever they had so that no one went hungry or otherwise suffered poverty. And this is perhaps our oldest lesson in social justice. The widows, the orphans, or anyone else who did not have the means to support themselves were supported by the faith community. That was part of the church's mission then, even as it is still today. However, just like we see in our society today, there were those who were taking advantage of the goodwill of others. People who were able to contribute to society were not. Yet, they were expecting to be looked after anyway. Paul points out that he had set the example for them when he lived and worked among them. He and his disciples, who had been among them to share the gospel and plant the church, also worked with them to earn their keep. Paul asserts that he could have asked to be fed and housed, but chose not to burden the faith community. Now, tradition has it that Paul was a leather worker and a tent maker, so there would no doubt have been plenty of work available. Everyone, he tells them, should quietly go about their work, earn their keep, and persist in doing what was right and good. Now, I include Paul's letter with the rest of these lessons today, uh, despite the fact that on the surface, it might not seem relative. But I believe it applies to this new creation that God and Jesus are promising as well. As I mentioned earlier, the, the fortunes of the Israelites throughout the Hebrew scriptures rose and fell with a, a certain regularity. When they turned away from God and went about doing things their own way, life deteriorated into disaster. When they admitted their need for God and followed God's commands, their lives improved and peace and prosperity returned. I really don't think much has changed. The world has seen wars, natural disaster, injustice, oppression, and, and all other sorts of evil. The glory days of our church were during the years just after the Second World War when people turned back to God at a time when darkness seemed to ready to overtake the world. Peace and prosperity returned and life was on the upswing. 
Now we live in a time when people are determined to follow their own way. Sports and recreation are more important than faith or the church. Even ministers in the church are turning away from God and preaching messages that are inconsistent with Scripture in an effort to gain popularity and job security. We are almost certainly on the downward slope of the cycle once again with a predictable income if we don't do something soon. This is true of society, but I believe it applies to our individual lives as well. If we live by our faith, life might not seem as easy or prosperous as we would like, but our ability to find joy while living it is exponentially increased. Our faith that there are calm seas on the other side of the storm, a light beyond the darkness, lessens the emotional impact that events beyond our control have over us. If we wish to see God's new heaven and new earth become a reality, though, we must work to help make it so. It starts with us. We cannot impose our faith upon others. Even Jesus never tried to do that. But we can set an example by living according to our faith consistently with integrity. That means standing up for social justice, reaching out to help the poor and marginalized, living every day by the great commandment to love God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your, loving your neighbor as yourself. It means being in church on Sunday morning or worshiping as best you can uh, must become a greater priority. We need the strength and support of a faith community to keep doing the things we know must be done. As Jesus told his disciples, following him isn't easy. We need all the help and support we can get in a world that seems determined to go in a different direction. We need to live in the world following our hearts more than our heads, thinking more about how we can help than what it will cost. We need to stop persecuting and discouraging those who are trying to make a difference. We must stop posting racist, hateful, demoralizing, divisive rhetoric on social media accounts. We need to smile more, say thank you more, offer words of gratitude and encouragement more, hold doors, carry groceries, visit neighbors, look up from our phones and look at the real live people around us. Flood the world we live in with kindness and respect. We need to treat creation with the same respect and care that we must offer other people. We're all connected in this web of life, so we must care for all living things, from people to squirrels to birds to fish. John Muir, who was responsible for the first national parks in the United States, was known as the Wilderness Prophet. Uh, and he stated over 100 years ago that the earth has no sorrows that earth cannot heal. However, for the earth to begin healing, humanity must stop wounding it. Out of love and respect for the Creator, we must do better at caring for creation. And if we work together and choose to turn to God to guide and help us now, we can turn the cycle of life before the next great disaster sends us running back to God out of desperation. And if, when we find ourselves on the upward slope of the wave, we stop this historic cycle of turning our backs on God when life is good, our trajectory will continue in a heavenly direction. And God's new creation will open before us a world of peace, justice, and compassion where no one goes hungry and the world knows nothing of prejudice, war, or oppression. But if we do not plant, we will never harvest. Let's pray. Lord, your Spirit is here, lifting us up, encouraging us to push forward, to dream of what God would have us do and become. Your love, power, and grace have already pour been poured upon us. Now you call on us to share those gifts with others, to look outside of ourselves and see the need for these same gifts in the world around us. We thank you, Lord, for these gifts. We thank you for the opportunities to share them. We are children of your covenant, 
You remain always faithful to your promises to us, despite our so frequent failure to show that same faithfulness and devotion to you. <coughs> you forgive us our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and promise us a new home where the evils of this world will not exist. In compassion and love you hold each of us in your heart and ask only that we would do the same for one another. Not everyone we encounter can have their needs met with kindness or friendship. For those whose needs exceed our ability to help, we pray that your healing spirit will intercede on our behalf. For those suffering illness, facing challenges that seem insurmountable, experiencing grief or living in poverty, oppression or violence, we pray. Your word speaks to us of catastrophe, violence and hardship. We know that this is not your will for us, but we see these evils all around us in our world. For those caught up in war in Ukraine, victims of violence and oppression in the Middle East, young people driven to despair by bullying, countless other examples of our broken relationships that appear in our daily headlines. We pray for the peace and justice that will come in your new creation. And we pray for a greater taste of that reality in this earth. Hear us, O compassionate one, as each of us name the people and concerns that weigh heavy on our hearts today, in silence where only your spirit can hear. God of heaven and earth, creator of every good thing, Lord of compassion and love, we offer these prayers this day as citizens of your kingdom, partners with your spirit, and disciples of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for this service is number 678, For the Healing of the Nations. In a world filled with blessings, we celebrate our privilege and our responsibility to share those blessings. Let us celebrate the God of overwhelming blessings by continuing our worship through the gifts of our hands. 
for the tithes and offerings we have received in support of our ministries. Let us give thanks. In gratitude and humble trust, we bring these gifts before you, O God, and offer them in support of the ministries of your church. In our offering, we acknowledge that what we have are gifts from you. May what we offer to your service and what we do in your name be blessed by your hand. Amen. The church is not a building. It's a community of care, a fellowship of saints, and an expression of God's love. If we confine it to this time and place, we have failed to be what Christ has called us to become. Every day, in all you do, demonstrate the love you find in God by sharing that love with others. As we draw this service to a close, we extinguish the Christ candle. But we carry the light of Christ with us in our hearts, wherever we go. May the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit lead and inspire you throughout the days ahead. Amen.